operations course, there was a, I, I was I had a few questions from people regarding the first assignment. The first question asks to construct that grid, that nine, nine entry grid. And the first part of the question is, is quite straightforward. If you look at many unit operations that you can think of that go into the table, you may get three for this one, you may only find one or two here, and you might find several over here. There's lots of different solid separations. And that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question then is to pick one of those in each of the grids. And then we'll go and talk a bit about what the inputs are, the outputs of the major and minor components. Just for one example from, from each entry. So that's question one. And you can submit it either electronically in Google Docs or um, printed paper for, for, uh, for M. Um, obviously, if you do something that's by hand or calculations and you want to submit by Google Docs, you can scan the images and paste it in as an image. Um, but it's entirely up to you. Uh, in fact, the TA may prefer paper. So if you if you run into paper, we need to stick to paper for M. So that's just a quick announcement for M. For the assignment tomorrow on the engineering economics, that's a group assignment as well. Again, please choose the Google Docs for paper. As long as the Google Docs is shared and, and received by 11:30, all the paper version is received by 11:30.
dollars now? One hundred fifty next year? For sure. Okay. That's obvious, right? Now, what about a hundred dollars now, or one hundred fifty dollars five years from now? Hundred dollars now. Hundred and fifty five years from now. Okay. So that's exactly why we're doing these calculations to find the equivalence between periods of time now and in the future. Because if I say now versus next year, we've got an intuitive feel for that, right? But now versus five years from now, and if I've got multiple monies flowing in and out during that period of time, then the analysis gets messy. We want to be able to establish an equivalence between periods of time. <coughs> I'm taking my future value and I'm relating it to my present value in this equation. Both equations are obviously identical. Okay, so you could interpret this equation over here, and we, and we did that uh, last class. We actually said we used a slightly different terminology. So if I take an investment I and I, I give it to the bank, they pay me interest rate I compounded, then I will get a future value F. So you can see it and interpret it in that light as well. Okay, so I'm taking. It's the potential for me to invest that money and, and have that future cash flow. The other thing that I may not have explained quite as clearly, and I think I can do a better job of it, is to explain the principle of compounding a little bit uh, clearer. There's one, one diagram that one can draw and show it as follows, is if we take our cash flow, and here we're now at time zero, and so here's my time zero, and here's my principal invested. I'm going to invest P dollars in the bank at time zero. And here's the interest earned. So then at, at time one, so I'm investing P dollars next to the bank. The interest earned is just before period one is finished, the bank will pay me interest in proportional to the amount that I've invested. So they'll pay me PI dollars. Just before the year ends. They, they'll, for, for that period of time, because I've lent them P dollars, they're going to pay me back PI dollars. So the amount that I have available to me at the start of next year is obviously P plus PI. That's now the amount that I've invested with the bank. I mean, I'm not withdrawing the interest that they pay me. Then come to the end of the second period. The bank will pay me now proportional to that to value, so P plus PI times I dollars. So at the start of period one, now, here I have P dollars in my bank account. At the start of period two, I have P one plus I dollars in my bank account. At the end of period one, at the start of period two, if I add the principal and the interest earned, I will I can show you can prove to yourself that it simplifies to P one plus I squared. Okay, so that's it's compounding now on that interest is compounded from the principal that I invest. And so then at the start of period two, I have P one plus I squared dollars invested. And the interest that they'll pay me at the end of the second period, at the start of the third period, is P one plus I squared times I dollars. So always I'm being paid in proportion to the amount that I have invested called the principal. And so then this money grows, this, these dots will move up in an exponential way, so this third one will be at P, 1 plus I, P. So that's, that's the principle of compounding. Now, we don't have banks paying a simple interest, but that's compound interest, but if, if banks did pay a simple interest, what would happen is, with simple interest, my principle is P dollars 
as a simple interest. At the end of that period, they were paying PI dollars as well. So then, at the, I would have P1 plus I available to me in my bank account. But at the end of the first period, start of the second period, the bank, instead of recognizing I've got a large amount of money, they still pay me in proportion to my original principal. So they may only give me PI dollars. So now I have P plus PI plus PI dollars. And then again, simple interest calls for just paying you always in proportion to your original investment, PI. So if you're being paid simple interest, you're being scammed. You want compound interest. But no, the, no one pays simple interest um, for, for their investments. But that, that is, you always see this in textbooks and you might come across this simple interest versus compound interest. Simple interest is always in proportion to your original principal. Compound interest recognizes that your principal is growing over time and you're always being paid in proportion to that growing amount. So the key, the key relationships here, this is created up here, the future value discounted by the denominator to get you the present value is, is a tool just to establish equivalence between periods of time. And this is what we call mathematical equivalence. So simply, P, let's come back to this. Yeah. Let's clarify that and, and emphasize that this is simply mathematical equivalence. Between periods of time. There's also decisional equivalence. equivalence, if you're a totally rational investor and rational behavior, your decisional equivalence is exactly the same as mathematical equivalence. It doesn't make a difference. But most of us, or all of us, are not rational. So come to that example of $100 now versus $150 five years in the future. At current discounting rates, then $150 in the future is actually a better deal than $100 now. But if I need to pay my rent, or I need to buy food, or I need to get somewhere, I need to pay for an airline ticket, or whatever the case is, I'd rather have that $100 now than $150 in the future. So I'm willing to forego that additional money based on some emotional condition or some other factor that I need to take into account. That's not mathematical. So many cases we'll, we can do the financial analysis, but we'll still end up going with emotional decision. So then, if you're totally rational, it, the two are equivalent. But in almost all cases, there's some other writing of emotional interest that takes a hold. So you'll see this one day when you need to purchase a house, and you may, there will be a house that's a better deal, but there's some other emotional issues that drive you from actually making a less sound economic purchase. And that's okay. We're not saying it's a bad thing, but at least now you can put a dollar value on your emotions. That differential is giving you an, a feeling of how much you're willing to forego certain certain economic aspects and pay for them. You're basically paying for your emotional happiness, in a sense, and you can put a dollar figure on it. So in my case, I, I decided to buy a bike rather than use a bus pass. The bike cost me way more than a bus pass. But... I can now put a dollar figure on what that, that additional amount is. Okay, so there's decisional equivalence, which is should be the same as mathematical equivalence, but it's not. Then there's also what you can call market equivalence. So market equivalence in the future that I'm, I want it now, in the present time, what's that called? What do we call it when we do that? You're borrowing money, you're loaning money. So if I'm buying
buying a house or a car, I'm converting my future earnings. I don't have the $100,000 now to buy that house or to do the $300,000. But I'm going to the bank and say, can you take my future money that I'm going to give you in, in equal payments or some sort of form of payments and convert it to present day money? And they will charge me an interest rate I, so called I subscript borrow, or I subscript loan. That's the mortgage amount, the loan amount, the interest. Rate. There's also when you convert present money to future money. And what's that called? Subscript lend. So you can either borrow at a certain interest rate, you're converting you know, your future money into present day money, or I can lend money to you, or the bank can lend money to you. They're converting their present money to future money. I'm lending money to a friend, I'm taking my present dollars that I have and giving it away and getting it back in the future. I'm going to charge an interest rate I lend. Okay, and so we'll we'll find that if you're a bank, I borrow is going to be greater than I lend. So that's how the banks make their money. Is that interest rate differential between the rate that they lend money out to you versus the rate that they're um, they're charging. To. So there's there's market equivalent for big companies who are lending and borrowing money internally, that rate is very close to equal internal. And so there's almost no, no difference to that. But for you as an individual, with a low level of money, and for most of us, for, for the rest of our lives, unless we, we get super rich, that difference between borrow and lending is always going to be uh, substantial. We're going to be paying for, for that, for that conversion, getting our future money into present day. So, all that this equation does for us is it's establishing a relationship across periods of time. And then what we're going to do, most commonly, is we'll use this form over here. We'll bring future cash flows, future expenses into present day dollars and make our decision now. So as long as my present day money makes me a profit, I'm going to go ahead with that investment. So I'm going to convert future cash flows, future expenses, future incomes, all going to get converted into present day. I'm going to do my comparison in present day terms to make a decision. There's no reason why I could not, and, and this, this does, you see this from time to time, I could work in the future. I can make my comparison F inflate all my values into the future, five years from now, convert my current expenses into what they would have been five years from now, convert my current cash flows and escalate them up into the future and make my comparison in the future. I'll come to exactly the same decision. So you'll never make a, a, wrong, a different, come to a different decision. But it is easier for us in general to convert future cash flows, incomes and future expenses into present day terms and then make our comparison. Okay. So with that in mind, I. We left last class with uh, this question over here, where we said, if we invested $5,000 into in a bank account right now with compound annual rate I star, so that we're taking that action, then we're saying the time value of money is given by a different rate, given by a rate I dash. During that period of time that that $5,000 is invested in the bank, I'm, I'm earning interest on it, so it's going to be worth more than $5,000 and years in the future. So five, and years in the future, six, seven, eight years in the future, that $5,000 is going to be greater with the annual compound interest of my staff. But let's bring that total amount back to the present day terms and calculate what the present day value of the total bank account value is. So, anyone got 
got the equation solved for that already? One, two. Do you want to work on it for a minute or two? And then we'll, we'll compare answers. So give it two, three minutes and uh, calculate your present value of the bank account. discounting time value of money is I dash. So if we use some notation here, I'll, I'll, use, I'll be consistent with the notes. The amount we've invested is, is capital C subscript zero. It's the present value of that investment is $5,000. What is the future value of that $5,000 when we're having annual interest compounded at, at rate I star? Standard application of the of the of that money, we're compounding it at an interest rate I star. Um, this is in the notes. We looked at last class. We said we used a little bit of a different notation. Um, we said the future balance at compound rate I, if I make investment capital I, is given by that equation. So here, I'm just substituting with a slightly different notation that's being used in the question. So we're making an investment capital C zero at rate I star for n periods of time. So that's what we will have n years in the future. That should be the dollar value I see in my bank account. But what's that worth in present day? So discount, discounting Fn back to present day. So if I convert that back to present day dollars, Back to present 
present day value then is used is equal to, Sean says it's Fn 1 plus i dash to the power n. Substitute then the relationship for Fn is equal to C0 1 plus i star and divided by 1 plus i dash. Investing money, it gets compounded and accumulates up n years into the future, and then I discount it back into present day dollar figures to calculate capital P. So this equation is, is a nice indication of actually what the time value of money rate I dash is. If I dash is equal to I star, what's what's happened? But you haven't lost any money either. Okay, so if I dash is equal to I star, you can show here that P is equal to C0. So the amount that I invested, C0, is equal to the in present day value. So P is equal to C0 here, I dash is equal to I star. So if the time value of this discounting is the same as the current interest rates charged by the bank, you're really no, no better off, but you're not worse off either. You haven't lost anything, you haven't gained anything. So it's often one way people use the time value of money is to use the prevailing interest rate as a, as a basis. You want to do at least as well as that, but hopefully better. And if you want to gain money, it's, it's obvious that you want that numerator. If you want P to exceed C0, so if you want your present day value to be worth more than what you started off with as an investment, then you would require, so for P to be greater than C0, you would require I dash to be Okay, so uh, there's there's those relationships uh, up the same. <coughs> Okay, let's take a look at this one then, quick. Uh, yes. Sorry. What if we found the real uh, the real rate of interest and did the calculation based on that? Would that work or not? The real rate of interest from the bank. I mean, if you have like how much the bank is giving you and how much is inflation, can you subtract them? Uh, yeah. So you could use those two. So the bank's interest rate I and the inflation rate I, and as long as the bank's interest rate and inflation rate are the same, you're, you're no better or worse off. But the bank's interest rate is never going to be greater than they. They're, they're probably going to pay you just below that in the interest rates. Like bank interest rates are, are very, very minimal in these days. I think what, what he's saying, like when we do it in class, we usually do, so the equation would be like C naught um, bracket 1 plus i star minus i prime. Then, so why does that not work in, in this situation? I think, okay, so what you're doing there is you're minusing i, I prime in the numerator. Because this doesn't simplify to that. Yeah, if I look yeah. At it, it shouldn't simplify to that. So the only thing I can think is in that equation, you've probably seen that in, in, in the economics class, I guess, is where you're coming from, is you're accounting already for inflation and in the numerator. So you're saying I'm going to earn interest, but there's my money's declining with some sort of inflation. And then you're ignoring time value of money. But I don't know why. I have to look at the assumptions that come into that equation. Uh, if you can tell me the economics book that you use, then I can see. Because it may be that you're not matching assumption for assumption. But this is the approach to take if you're simply escalating future, uh, your current money into the future and then bringing it back to make a comparison to present concerns, ignoring inflation. But your inflation is implicit in I dash because whatever inflate your time value of money is, it's going to either be inflation or, or greater. So inflation is captured in that, in that I dash term. So a lot of this hinges on 
Uh, what value do I use for I star? That's an easy one to find. What value do you use for I dash? The time value of money. Okay, so there, there, what value you use for I, for I dash, the time value of money, is, is what can change your, your scenario. So we'll look at um, what, how you can estimate the reasonable value of I dash. So some companies, they just use a flat value internally of, of 5 or 10%. Other companies will take a prevailing rate of inflation and then add a few percent on it as a safety. But yeah, please let me know about that, that textbook and I can check it. Okay, let's take a look at this exercise then. Uh, this one should be very quick. We have $1,000 coming in every year for the next four years. So first you just draw a cash flow diagram to get most of that. And then determine what this income is at the beginning of the first year. So total up those thousand dollar cash flows, <laughs> discounting them each by the appropriate amount, and then bring them into present day values and sum them up. year that you're going to receive this thousand dollars is right now, so September 2012. And if you're a new undergraduate, you'll be getting a thousand dollars this year, a thousand next year. So four periods, but we're numbering in zero, one, two, three. Your cash flow diagram equal upward line because these are inflows of money. So you don't have a y axis usually. So those are my inflows as a cash flow diagram. Now determine the income from each of those years back in present day. One way to lay out these calculations is uh, the systematic approach is we'll just use a table uh, where I'll down our rows, I'll use my first row as I write in the period and I look. So in, 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 the, in this period, I'm considering that period zero, period one, period two, period three. Lay this out in the spreadsheets in this manner, for example. My inflows every single year C, I'm getting $1,000. Just never use cents, just always use dollars. Don't, uh, 
unless it's appropriate, you're dealing with such small numbers that the cents actually make a difference. But for the most part, work in, 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 in only dollars. And if you're working with really large figures, work in thousands or millions. Don't, uh, don't sweat the, the minor numbers. So 909. 909. The next one. Divided by 1.21 or 1.1 squared is 826. Third. That's 1,000 divided by 1.3. Just writing it out this way so you can see the denominator growing over time to emphasize that this counting is $751. And the total present value is then the sum of those four. So the total of the present values is 3486. Interpret that three thousand four hundred and eighty six dollars. What is the meaning of that? Total total money that you would have received over four years in present day. Another way to interpret this. Is, uh, using that relationship we had up there earlier, the other way to interpret it is using this equation up there, or that concept up there, and is to say, if someone had given me $3,486 and I had invested it at compound interest at 10%, I, I would have ended up with $4,000 by the, by the end of the third year. But it doesn't make allowance for you drawing that money out during the over those four years. But if someone did give me 3486, I would have had $4,000 by the end of the four years. Mm -hmm. okay, so those, uh, those calculations are usually done in Excel or just with you know, this one, it's so trivial. But in general, um, Work, work with a single uh, round for the US dollars. Um, here's just a copy and paste from a spreadsheet, so there's a bit more detail there. But in general, don't just set your spreadsheet settings to round up to, to whole numbers. So the, the, where we're going with this is what we're going to do is I'm going to take cash flows that occur in the future. So here I've got a cash flow one that's positive, a cash flow two that overall is positive. In the third year, my Overall expenses exceed my income, so I have a negative cash flow, and then I have the positive cash flow in the fourth year. What I'm doing is I'm discounting each one of those cash flows by the appropriate amount and bringing it into present day terms. So here I'm bringing cash flow one into present day terms. Cash flow two is brought into present day terms. Three and cash flow four are brought into present day terms. I'm summing them up and then calculating total cash flow in present day terms. So this is where we're going, going with that. Um, and, and the reason is because we're going to use it as, as, as John here, we want to compare apples with apples. We're going to compare multiple projects. Some projects may have a 10-year horizon of incomes and expenses. Other projects have a three-year horizon of income and expenses. How can we compare them fairly? It's through this approach. Right? So it does, what the nice thing about the time value of money calculation is allow us is that even though we have seemingly unequal durations, or we have unequal durations in terms of project horizons, so coming back to that example we had right at the beginning of the class on, on changing the distillation column, it may be really quick and easy to outsource my distillation uh, increase, the, that increased volume of product that I need to produce. It, it's easy to outsource that to someone else. It's much longer to build a whole new distillation column myself. Those two projects have very different horizons or timelines. But if I convert each one of them to their present day terms, no matter what the horizon, then I can make a fair comparison in the present day. So that's, that's where we're heading with that. Um, here's a, 
how much time do we have? Okay, so, so in general, if you read these textbooks, they go through tables and tables of these um, P and F and U and T values. I'm not interested in that. They're, they're good, they're useful in some situations, but we're going to always just rely on this formula that the present value and the future value are related by the interest rate and the, and the end. We're going to do our work in Excel, mostly. And as you can see here, um, there's many, many applications to your own use in the future. So most recently, in August, I was helping a friend. They were deciding between a home equity line of credit versus renewing their mortgage with Royal Bank. And I spent an afternoon looking at their the two scenarios, and I did the spreadsheet for them. Like, so this was a psychiatrist and a guy who does hair. So neither of them know how to how to do this sort of thing. So it, it, in, in an hour or two, it was actually quite easy to make up a, a comparison between the two, and it was a no-brainer then to go with the home equity line of credit. Uh, so it's you will use this over and over in your own life um, in the future. So what I want you to do for the next. Um, 10 minutes to end the class is you should be sitting with your group members or close to your group members. And this is also going to be part of the next tutorial and, and handbook and next assignment. You're going to calculate the time value of money for a university degree. Okay? Now it's really easy for you and your group to estimate these numbers because you've gone through four years. So you know what from high school to now roughly your expenses and and in incomes might be. Now obviously it's a group project, so um, you're going to have five very different diverse sources of income and, and your expenses might be roughly the same in each of the cases. So your income scenario might be different. It, that, that's, so what, what I'd like you to do is, is to even think about the you know, following way. Uh, you may want to each prepare your own NPV or your net present value. Yeah, or you might want to just do it as a group and pick an average number across your group. Um, so I'm not really too concerned how you estimate your sources of income. But as long as it's realistic, or it might be quite exceptional if you're focusing only on one person's scenario. But you may agree as a group just to do an average of that. So what you need to think of is all your income and expenses during your five years of university, four or five years of university. And then this scenario is not going to end it's, we're going to take it 10 years from now. So here you need to estimate what your income and expenses might look like 10 years from now, either for yourself or a hypothetical person. That's the first one. Then you're going to repeat that for someone who did not attend university. What would their income and expense profile look like over the next uh, 15 years? So four years, five years after graduating from high school, plus another 10 years after that. So, and we're going to compare both scenarios. This uh, exercise is going to be reused at least at two other occasions throughout the course. So, it's I'll, I'll leave you for five minutes now to work with your group members and start to estimate not dollar values, but at least what the incomes are and what the expenses are going to be, and, um, and list that. We'll then take it up in the next tutorial.